This week's video shows you how I make a very simple beaker, a drinking cup. These are arguably one of the most simple forms I make, and whilst they are very simple, they're also thrown very thinly, so they can be a little bit tricky, and your clay needs to be in just the right condition. Each ball of stoneware clay weighs about 260 grams, plus or minus 10 or so, which just makes weighing out faster. They're given a good wedge, and then I'm ready to throw. This method of wedging here is one I only really use for smaller lumps of clay and involves smacking them down hard and then rolling them out again, which generally pushes out most of the little bubbles that might be left, and perhaps more importantly incorporates all the bits of clay into one homogeneous lump. All of these balls of clay are then brought over to the wheel, where generally speaking I wrap them up in some plastic just to stop them from drying out as I'm working. This is especially important in the summer, and even now, as my studio tends to be quite drafty, the balls of clay, if left exposed, quickly harden around the outside, which can cause issues later when you're centering and pulling up the walls of clay. For these beakers, I really centre and cone them thoroughly, because as they are thrown so thinly, any tiny inconsistency along the way will just exaggerate as the clay is pulled up and stretched. Once centred, I flick down my throwing pointer and I open up the ball of clay. I tend to use my thumb and my forefinger to do this movement, but equally you'll see potters using two thumbs and even two index fingers. It really depends on personal preference, I think. No one way is better than another. Here you'll see that I pour the water on the top of my hand, so it goes down both my fingers on the inside of the vessel and my fingers down the outside of the vessel, covering both parts. When you're pulling up the walls, they really need to be kept wet, as if the clay becomes dry, it'll likely stick to your fingers. And as soon as it sticks to your hand, Usually it draws the whole pot off centre, and really what you want is for the clay to flow very smoothly between your fingers, with as little friction or hindrances as possible. Each pull needs to be smooth and consistent, from bottom to top. For my final few pulls I tend to use the tip of my index finger, rather than my knuckle. I do this as I feel I can be a little more precise, and I can also exert a bit more pressure I think, to really move those very last remnants of clay in the lower half of the walls. Once the height is more or less there, I do one last pull, just to get the shape more or less right. Then finally I can move on to the finishing procedures for this pot, which starts by removing the skim of clay around the base. For this I'm just using a very old, blunted turning tool, it's nothing special. Then, I remove the excess water from the inside, which is very important, as if you leave them with water in overnight, the water will disintegrate the base of the pot. Then I take my metal kidney, place it at the base, and gently run my fingers up against the clay the whole way up. What I'm doing here is pushing the clay out against the metal. I'm not forcing the metal into the clay, as doing so can cause the clay to catch on the metal and twist out of shape. Lastly, I chamois leather the beveled rim, and then carefully drag a very taut wire underneath. Then, with dry hands, I can very gently clasp around the pot and lift it away. There's a certain knack to this, and clays that contain a little bit of grog are much easier to pick off as compared to very smooth clays. At the moment in these wintry months, I can place the board of freshly thrown pots on the floor to firm up overnight. There are less drafts down here, and by morning generally, they're the perfect leather hard condition to start trimming. But if the bases are still a little tacky, I'll flip them over onto their rims and place them up somewhere high for half an hour or so, above the heaters, which will take away that slight dampness the pots have. For trimming these, I use a specially made leather hard chuck, I threw this months ago, and I keep it wrapped up in plastic just to keep it at the right condition. It's completely solid and has a very simple curve on the outside so it ends up fitting lots of different pots. I wet its base and gently rub it into the middle of the wheel, which is enough to hold it firmly in place. The roundness of the chuck also helps to correct any distortions the rims of the pots might have taken on as they dried overnight, and the fact that it's leather hard, and therefore slightly tacky, helps it stick slightly to the pot, holding everything in place. There isn't much to trim on these. I simply skim off a thin layer on the outside and neaten up the form, making sure the sides of the pots are nice and straight and smooth. I try to get rid of most of the throwing lines, and I don't mind if there are a few subtle ones at the end, but I will always remove the prominent ones if there happen to be any. Finally, I use a sharp metal kidney just to smooth over the trimming marks on the outside. And then it's time to work on the base. First, I trim away a beveled edge on the outer diameter of the pot. If left very sharp, this edge is quite susceptible to chipping. The base of the pot is often banged onto tables or onto shelves, so this just helps to prevent any damage that can occur, especially with a high iron clay body that's reduction fired, as it's generally just weaker than other clay bodies out there. 
I then use the sharp edge of metal kidney just to burnish over the clay, again to remove any turning marks and to ensure it's nice and neat. This again, of course, is personal preference. Some potters leave in many more making marks, whilst others remove almost all of them. I like to think I'm somewhere in the middle. To remove the pots from my chuck, I grasp them and then spin the wheel, which breaks the seal between the two pieces. And then we move on to the next. Usually I trim about 30 to 40 of these pieces at any one go. Each only takes a minute or so, so it doesn't take too long. One important thing to note is that as I'm trimming, you'll notice that my two hands are almost always connected in some kind of way. Be it that my thumbs are touching, or perhaps one thumb is reaching across and touching the other hand. This keeps my hands very sturdy, which is especially important when you're trimming, as one slip is all it takes to ruin a pot. Leather hard clay is really very soft still, and as this pot is very thinly thrown and trimmed, I need to actually be very gentle with all my movements. I never squeeze the pot too hard, or apply too much pressure with the tool I'm working with. You have to be careful, yet work with enough vigour to actually remove clay and complete the task at hand quickly, which, simply put, just requires practice. Ruining pots when you're trimming is important, as it shows you the limitations of the material you're working with. Once bone dry, all these pieces can be packed into my electric kiln for a bisque firing. This changes the clay from being very fragile to much harder and quite absorbent too, which it needs to be to absorb the glaze that is poured or dipped over. I like to pack my bisque kilns very tightly, they fire better that way, and these beakers are always quite useful to fill up all those otherwise unusable spaces. Once full, I fire this kiln to a thousand degrees centigrade overnight, and once it's cooled, usually a day or so later, I can move on to the next step. Every single pot is carefully unpacked, and then I wax the bottoms of each. This acts as a simple resist and prevents the glaze from being absorbed into areas I don't want it. That extra dab is just to make sure my maker's mark is totally covered. Next comes the glazing. This is a very simple glaze made up of mostly feldspar and nepheline cyanide amongst other things. The red hue comes simply from 2% red iron oxide mixed into the base recipe, otherwise the glaze is just white, like you'll see later. After a long time of not using the glazes, the glaze settles into the bottom of the bucket, which takes some mixing to get it back into a usable state once again. I dunk each pot using a pair of tongs, clasping not too tightly, as doing so can quite literally cause the pot to explode sending shards everywhere, including into the glaze. They can be an awkward tool to use at the beginning, but after some practice it's almost just like an extension of your hand. Each beaker is submerged for about 4 or 5 seconds, and then I carefully remove them and shake off any excess drips. All these raw materials are suspended in water, and when the piece is dunked, all the water is absorbed into the porous clay body, leaving a layer of material on the outside of the pot. If you leave them submerged for too long, the pots can become oversaturated and your glaze won't cling nicely to the vessel. And equally, if you don't submerge them for long enough, the glaze might not give you the desired effect. So there can be quite a lot of trial and error before you find the perfect amount of time to dunk your pots for, and the method of doing so. The techniques I show in this video might not work for you, and the list of variables is almost endless. The thickness of the walls of your pot make a big difference, as does the type of glaze you're using of course, the clay body too, and the type of firing you do. So don't necessarily go by what you see in YouTube videos or online. You really do have to find out the very best method for yourself. Here's one glazing tip that I was taught by a teacher of mine. Always place the tools you're using for glazing onto the respective bucket lid. This helps to keep your workspace tidy and centralises the glaze's mess onto a place where it doesn't really matter. Here's the white version of the same glaze. It's practically the same, save 2% red iron oxide. This was filmed a few days later now, once the glazes have had time to really dry out. As they dry, the glaze surface goes from being very tacky and sticky and coming off in clumps to incredibly powdery, and once powdery I can very easily clean away any excess drips along with the tongue marks. I then use a wet sponge to remove any droplets of glaze that have settled over the wax, and then very carefully sponge around the circumference, making sure the line where glaze and clay meet is as perfect and straight as I can possibly get it. As the neater it looks now, the better it'll look once fired, so I do try to work very carefully as if you apply too much pressure, it's very easy to chip the glaze, especially around the rim, and repairing it can be a pain, and generally speaking it'll never look quite as good as how it did when it was freshly dipped. The marks from the tongs are easily cleaned over, I simply rub around where they are, and the excess powder that comes off my fingertips usually fills the holes up very neatly. I should mention, directly below where I'm working is a large basin of water, this collects all the excess dust that comes off, and eventually all this excess can be recycled back into my main buckets of glaze. So really, there's very little waste, 
This process is repeated for several hundred pots. It's a long, arduous task, but it's worth doing well, as messy glazing can really show in the end piece. The final step in the long creation of a piece of pottery is to glaze fire them. At the moment I'm using a mains gas fired roder kiln. It's a front loader as compared to my electric kiln which is a top loader, which I've always preferred, mainly because the sight of a fully packed kiln is just that bit more impressive. Each layer is carefully packed with as many pots as I can fill it with, which can be a bit of a puzzle sometimes. This process itself takes about an hour or two, and it's one that needs to be done with the utmost care and attention, as no two pieces can be touching, otherwise they'll fire and stick together. Early the next morning I'll come in to light the kiln, where I always make sure that all four burners are lit before I close up and seal the door. This prevents potentially explosive accidents. The entire process of firing takes about nine and a half hours, and there's a lot of details that I'm going to skip over here, but I do have a video that goes into everything in much greater detail, a link to which there should be on the screen now. I fire my pots with a gas kiln as it allows me to fire in a state called reduction. This is when you essentially stifle the kiln of oxygen by partly closing over the dampers that cover the flues and by increasing the gas pressure and the air pressure. This causes the internal combustion to happen inefficiently and as the fuel inside needs oxygen to burn efficiently, this is why you start to see flames coming out of the back and out of the spy holes on the front of the door too. The internal atmosphere inside the kiln begins to reach inside the clay and the glazes themselves, stripping away the oxygen molecules from the iron molecules, and in turn producing surfaces that are pretty much unobtainable in an electric kiln. This is where the greens at the end come from, which are very much like celadon glazes. During the summer, the studio becomes almost unbearably hot during this process. And in the winter it's the complete opposite. It's actually very nice and it warms up the studio greatly. And finally, after about nine and a half hours of firing, I can switch off the kiln, which is always accompanied by beautiful silence. About a day and a half later, once the kiln has cooled down to about 150 degrees centigrade, I can crack it open. This is always an extremely anxious moment, as during the entire firing process you haven't actually been able to look inside and see what's happening. All you see are white hot shiny pots, so it's very difficult to gauge what the actual surfaces are doing. But at this moment, when you finally crack the door open, all is revealed. The soft tinkling noise you can hear is the sound of the glazes contracting over the stoneware clay body beneath. This doesn't continue for long, but still occasionally pots in my house will randomly tinkle months or even years after they've actually been fired. These spiky things I'm removing now are the pyrometric cones which again, I'd recommend you watch my firing video to learn more about. Every single one of these pots is carefully inspected as they are removed. There's so much to go over, and it can take hours to really have a good look at everything. I'd say I have about a 95 or a 98% success rate with this kiln, along with a few occasional surprises, such as slightly oxidised pots and other oddities, which are always such fun to discover. Work isn't over yet though, I polish the base of every single pot just with some wet and dry sandpaper and all the lidded jars have a valve grinding paste compound smeared into the gap where the lid meets the body which is then ground in, smoothing off the join. And finally they're ready to be photographed for my online shop, which is a whole other story altogether and something I might make a video about in the future if there's enough interest in that subject. Anyhow, I'll leave you with some footage that shows a white glazed beaker and a dark green beaker which is what this whole video has been working towards. Thanks for watching.